In this video, we're going to finish off our atomic physics topic with a discussion of Feynman diagrams, how they're related to particle physics, and a particle known as the Higgs boson, uh, how it was discovered, and what it means for our understanding of the standard model. So to start us off, here is the data booklet for IV physics topic 7. Uh, you'll notice here what we've really been looking at in this last section here at particle physics has been this bottom section, this topic 7.3 with our combination of quarks and leptons, as well as the force particles and fundamental forces that are listed in the table down below. We're going to be referencing this document a little bit today as well, uh, looking specifically at how these particles interact with each other and what the force particles will do kind of in conjunction with those other matter particles as well. And here is the standard model. This is basically the periodic table of particle physics, and it's a way of organizing these particles into categories as well as kind of trends. Uh, you'll notice that the quarks here are all connected together, as well as the leptons down here. You'll also notice that the red here are these are the force carriers, so gluon uh, for the strong nuclear force photon for electromagnetic force, and then the Z and W bosons for the weak force. Uh, and then here is a boson called the Higgs uh, boson. Now this is something that we will talk about in just a minute. That it is kind of a, a part of all of these fields together. It is a central part of the standard model to make everything work out. You'll also notice on this particular standard model, some other things that are, are set up. There are these faint outlines kind of connecting the gluon with the quarks because that is what the gluon will associate with. Uh, a faint outline here connecting the photon with the quarks as well as these electron, muon, and tau. The photon will interact with anything that could have a charge. So basically any matter particle here except for the neutrinos. Uh, the Z and W bosons can interact with everything as part of the weak nuclear force. And then Higgs will be part of all of it as well. Sometimes you'll see it organized in a wheel like this. It's just another way of presenting the same general idea. So one thing that you need to know about in uh, our understanding of particle physics is something called a particle accelerator. And the largest, largest of these by far is the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC. Uh, this is truly an international project. This is something that actually crosses country borders. It is all underground, and this is a set, uh, a series of different particle accelerators. And what I mean by a particle accelerator is essentially this giant magnetic tube um, built with uh, superconducting magnets, uh, chilled to a very, very low temperature. And this magnetic field allows scientists to accelerate particles, keeping them centralized inside that, that field. And you'll, you can send it around this large ring. Uh, and you'll see here, there are several different stages that it will spin up to a certain speed, and then go to the next stage, spin up even faster to the next stage, stage spin up even faster until it finally gets to the Large Hadron Collider. And this is a very, very large circumference and it can sped up to almost the speed of light. So move these particles around really, really, really fast to ultimately collide them in the area of a detector. Uh, over here, you'll see a picture of what this detector looks like. Uh, and you'll notice for scale down there, that is one person, a scientist standing next to that. So these things are several stories tall and they have a lot of different electronics there to detect basically the shrapnel that comes out of these collisions. And ultimately what it looks like will be something, uh, we'll see a picture of it in just a minute, uh, but my bow tie is actually a, a particle pathway uh, from one of these collisions. So you can trace kind of the trajectory as these things kind of tail off. Uh, and by looking at how far they go and the curvature that they make and the charge that they have, you can actually predict um, what sorts of things are coming out of this collision and identify the certain energies that are coming out of those, um, those particle interactions that happen. Now, I mentioned that this is pretty large. Here, if you are in Minnesota in Minnetonka High School, 
here is Minnetonka High School. If you were to build this Large Hadron Collider below that, you'll see that this thing is about 5.4, about 5.5 miles in diameter. This thing is one of the largest machines ever built, if not the largest machine ever built. And like I said, it was truly an international project. It went under the borders uh, of several, or a couple of different countries. It was also extremely expensive. This is something that many different countries have been a part of financially, as well as just involving scientists from around the world. This has truly been an international project, and it's the only one of this kind in the world right now. So it, any top uh, research that's happening, kind of cutting edge stuff has to happen there, which is what draws scientists from all over the world. And one of the main discoveries of this, one of its big claim to fame, is this is the area that first discovered the Higgs boson. Um, the Higgs boson is part of the standard model. And it's basically the particle that is part of this larger Higgs field. And the Higgs field is what gives particles with mass their mass. So where does their mass come from? Well, it's their interaction with this Higgs field. And if you were to excite that Higgs field enough, uh, you should be able to see an energy that corresponds to the energy of this particle, known as the Higgs boson. And this had been theorized for many years, but didn't have the actual equipment to figure out where it was, like what, what was actually there, and actually experimentally prove that this is true. Well, here is that particle uh, accelerator collision that I was mentioning earlier, similar, similar to my bow tie here. Well, this data is being visualized in this way, showing the paths of these. But you can also visualize that data in terms of um, how many events are happening at certain uh, energies. So here we have uh, these different energies, these masses that are present, presented in giga electron volts. Um, and you'll see that there's quite a bit of background noise overall. But there's one area that rises a little bit above that background noise. And that happens to match perfectly the theorized value for where they were going to find the Higgs boson. Um, so this is kind of a, a visualization of the data that was used to kind of confirm this theory that the Higgs boson is exactly where they predicted it to be um, as part of the prediction of the standard model. So um, when you are presenting particle physics and these particle interactions. There are a couple different ways to do so. Uh, in the last video, we talked about quarks and leptons and these conservation equations and looking at that particle interaction that way. Well, there is another famous way to do this, and that is representing it in a picture, this picture known as a Feynman diagram. It's possible that you've seen kind of these squiggly arrow drawings before. It's kind of a classic particle physics look. Well, let's get a, a glimpse at what these are and um, kind of get a surface level view of how we can use these to understand these particle interactions. Well, Feynman diagrams, I think it helps to understand them as basically being like comics. So in a comic, a good comic, you'll have a classic setup. So here's Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes, up, up, and away. Well, in a particle interaction, let's say we have a setup of an electron and a positive electron or a positron or anti-electron, however you want to refer to that, an electron and a positive positron that are heading right toward each other. Now, the event is what happens. This is kind of the interaction that takes place. In this case, the event is the collision of this electron and positron. And then finally, you have the result. The result of Kelvin is woomphing into the ground. The result of this electron and positron coming together is a little photon. It's a packet of energy that's emitted. So we can talk about this. We can say an electron and positron, um, or anti-electron, annihilate into a photon. So afterward, there is no longer mass of these electron and positron. Instead, it is just energy, energy being carried away by this packet of energy known as a photon. Now, you'll notice in this that there are some characters that, that will show up. Um, we will often talk about matter particles. Matter particles are going to be represented in a Feynman diagram as an arrow pointing forward, uh, in this case, forward being to the right. An antimatter particle is an arrow pointing backward, in this case, backward being toward the left. 
you'll see in a minute that won't always be the case. Uh, we can identify our, our axes in a slightly different way, however we are choosing to represent the particle interaction. So matter particles are represented by these solid lines with an arrow point pointing in the proper direction for matter or antimatter. You'll also notice here that I've listed out the four fundamental particle, uh, fundamental force particles, these bosons. Um, we have different ways that we'll represent these as well. A photon, we will typically represent by kind of a squiggly line here. Um, that's kind of the classic thing that you see in a lot of the different Feynman diagrams. Uh, oftentimes it's used for all of these, but uh, traditionally these have their own distinct ways of representing. So a photon is a squiggly line. A gluon is kind of this swirly, curly line. And then the bosons here, the Z and W bosons, are represented by a dotted line, typically. So let's see some examples of this. Um, let's start by looking at this same annihilation of an electron and positron. Um, in our three-panel comic, we have them coming together, colliding, annihilating each other, and then producing this photon coming out. Well, we can represent time in a couple different ways. Uh, traditionally, I like to represent time going from left to right because that's the way that I read. So here, if I were to represent this interaction with time, I'm going to start with my electron and my positron. Notice that time here is going from left, left to right. Um, left to right means that a forward-facing arrow is pointing left to right. That is my electron. And my positron is pointing to the left. Well, time is still moving to the right. This positron is not moving left. It is just an anti-electron. And remember, for anti-particles, we are going to represent them as a backward-facing arrow. So here, my electron is pointing forward. My, elect my positron, my anti-electron, is pointing backward. They come together in a junction and produce this photon represented by a squiggly line. Um, notice here, if we are looking at it in the sake of time, um, going from left to right, we start with a two particles, and then we have a junction, and we end up with just a photon. So that is one way that we can show this interaction. If I wanted to, I could also present this going up. Um, sometimes IB will present it left to right. Sometimes it will present it from top or bottom to the top. Um, so if I were to present that same interaction, it would look something like this. Um, notice here, going forward in time means we're going up. We start with two particles. They annihilate into a photon. Um, notice here, this anti-electron, this positron, is still pointing backward. Backward, in this case, is going down. doesn't mean that it's moving down. It's different than a vector. Uh, it just means that it's an anti-particle, not a particle like an electron. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, let's see if we can match some of these. Here are four different interactions. And notice, these look almost the same. There are two arrows, one going in, one coming out of the junction. Uh, and then there is a squiggly line. But notice here that the time is going from left to right. So it is important to see what we are starting with and what we are ending with. Here are some different descriptions. Uh, so let's start here with purple. A photon spontaneously pair produces an electron and a positron. That means that starting at the beginning of time in this axis, we have a photon. Well, there is only one example here that starts with a single photon, the farthest left, and that is this last example. So the photon then produces a um, electron and a positron. Electron moving forward, positron moving backward. Next, we have a positron that absorbs a photon and keeps going. So positron means that it should be backward facing. Um, so in this case, since time is moving to the right, backward facing would mean pointing to the left. Um, so here I have a backward facing arrow um, and a photon, both existing at that same point in time. They're coming together. Uh, this positron absorbs that photon, and then what we have left is just a positron, no photon anymore. So it absorbs the photon and it keeps going. Next, we have an electron emitting a photon and keep going. Uh, here is basically the same idea, uh, only we have a forward-facing vector or forward-facing arrow 
um, that at its junction produces a forward facing arrow and a photon, an electron and a photon. And then finally here, an electron and positron annihilating into a photon. We saw that earlier. That is the example that we started with. All right, so these can be more complicated because we can have all sorts of different particles that are showing up in these diagrams. So the junction will always be conserved. So every junction that you have will always have two lines with arrows. One line will always be pointing in and one line will always be pointing out. Again, that doesn't mean that that is the direction that is moving um, because that can just represent if it's a particle or antiparticle. You'll also see at each of these junctions, there will be a single exchange particle. Um, so that is those squiggly lines or dotted lines or the curly lines that we saw earlier. In this case, we have a neutrino, electron neutrino, an electron, and this W plus boson. Now, at these junctions, we also know that before and after, according to time, so that means to the left of this junction and to the right of this junction, we will have conservation of the same numbers that we saw in the last uh, lecture. So baryon number, lepton number, and charge should be conserved before and after. Strangeness number as well. We'll ignore strangeness number unless there is a strange quark. So looking at baryon number, a neutrino has no quarks. It has no baryon number. Same thing with an electron, has no quarks, has no baryon number. Same thing with a boson. Boson is not made out of quarks, so it has no baryon number. Now, a lepton, uh, like a neutrino, has a lepton number of one. Uh, a lepton, like an electron, has a lepton number of one as well. This boson, this W+, plus, has no leptons, has no lepton number. That is zero. Charge, uh, we see this ant or this neutrino. Neutrinos have no charge. If you look at your table, uh, that is a charge of zero. An electron, as we know, has a charge that has a charge of negative one. And we have not talked about the charge of bosons. Uh, an easy way to know the charge of one of these charged bosons, like W or Z, is just to look at the sub or superscript here. This plus means that it has a charge of plus one. All right, let's look to see if this is conserved. My baryon number before and after is zero, conserved. My lepton number before and after is one, that is conserved. And my charge before is zero, and then after is negative one plus one, that is conserved as well. So this junction satisfies our rules. Everything is conserved within this. Now, that isn't going to be the only way that you use this. You're not going to just say yes or no, whether or not it's conserved. Instead, you can use this pr to predict what is going to be produced. Um, so by process of elimination, figure out what needs to be there uh, and understand how to next draw your your Feynman diagram. So let's do that. Uh, let's look at beta negative decay. Beta negative decay, as we have seen before, is a neutron that turns into a proton and then produces an electron and an antineutrino as part of it. We're going to represent time going from left to right, starting with a neutron. Um, so our rules are at a junction, you will have to have one arrow going in and one arrow going out, and then some sort of boson. Um, one of these force carrying particles. So here we have a neutron to start with. The most similar thing to a neutron um, in these products that are produced in this particle interaction is a proton. So this neutron is going to turn into a proton. Um, notice here, these are both particles. They are, you can actually have an anti-neutron or an anti-proton. Uh, in this case, these are just normal neutron, normal proton. They are facing forward in the scale of time. Um, we will have a particle here emitting. Uh, let's not worry too much about this dotted line just yet, but we know we need something there uh, because there can only be three uh, lines in the interaction. We've got the neutron, the proton, and now this, this boson. Now that uh, will help us get these other two particles that we know are produced in the end. So we can draw in those other two particles an electron here as a forward facing arrow because that is a, a lepton, not an anti lepton. And we have this anti neutrino. It is an anti lepton. So this anti particle must be facing backward for our arrow. And we see that there. Um, so let's check a couple things in our junction rules. We know that each junction has an arrow coming in and an arrow going out. 
as well as a boson. Here we have an arrow going out, an arrow going in, and this boson. So our junction rule is satisfied in that way. We can also look at the, um, the charge here. Uh, we can look at baryon number as well. The baryon number and lepton number are both conserved, but charge is the interesting one here, that we have a charge of zero, this neutron, and a charge of plus one here, which means that if the overall charge after has to be equal to the overall charge before, we need something to balance out this plus one. We need a minus one charge here. Um, that is going to be given to us by a W minus boson. Um, this is one of the bosons it, responsible for our weak force interaction. It is the weak force that produces beta negative decay and beta positive decay. In this case, we know it's a negative because of the junction rule and the conservation. You can also think of it as basically carrying the negative charge down to produce that negative electron. So you can see that that junction is also now conserved because we have negative before and after. Another way that we might represent this in a way that I've seen this represented before as well is instead of drawing in a neutron and a proton, drawing it as its component parts. We know that a neutron is an up quark and two downs, and a proton is an up quark, or two up quarks and a down quark. In that process, two of the quarks can stay the same. All you need to do is flip one of them to change this neutron to a proton. So you could also represent the same idea, same interaction like this, where an up quark stays the same, a down quark stays the same, and all you are doing is flipping one of the down quarks into an up quark. The rest is exactly the same as the way that we've drawn it. All right, with that in mind, we can do the same thing for beta positive decay. The only difference here is that we are starting with a proton. A proton turns into a neutron. They are both particles facing forward with their arrows. We need a boson connecting them. That produces an anti-electron, which is a positron, backward facing because it's anti, and a neutrino that is forward facing. To make the conservation of charge work, we have a positive charge and then a neutral and a positive charge, a positive charge and then a positive and neutral. So this must be a positive boson, so a W plus weak force boson. Again, we can also present this in another way, showing the quarks that are responsible in this case, for the proton, a, a up quark flips into a down quark and then produces that positive W boson. All right, in this video, you should be familiar with this idea of conservation within a junction, but also this idea of representing um, these different particle interactions in the form of a Feynman diagram um, presented in an axis of time to show some sort of particle interaction that's happening.